Um, and then I just wanted to share this really brief. I'll keep it brief since we're on live stream. Um, and the clock's not counting down, so y'all are in trouble. It, it's, <laughs> nah, I don't, that ain't my fault. I'm gonna just go ahead and say it right up front. It ain't my fault. All right. No, uh, what I was gonna simply say is that, um, you know, re so it's just been really, just really having a wonderful time with the Lord. It's almost like constant all day long. You know, I'm praying, I'm reading, I'm praying, I'm reading. And, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the scriptures, and, and I need y'all to hear my heart here yes. um, because it's really about what God is doing in me. It's not about anybody's expectations. One thing I learned as a leader, as a leader, you have to know what the Lord is calling you to do and follow him or else you're going to be led by people. And, and so, you know, reading through the scriptures, you know, in the Old Testament, they mourn for 30 days. They mourn for Moses for 30 days. And, um, and uh, even, even, uh, even when God talked to Samuel and said, you know, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Different situation. But over the weekend, the Lord has really just worked on me and just drawn me closer to him. And he's saying, he's showing me that the way to honor my wife, the way to honor her is to get up and serve him the way we were called to serve him. And so I got to stand on my feet and move forward now, you know, because that's where healing comes from. OK, um, tomorrow is 30 days. And so, you know, those are one of those things where he's calling me to stand on your feet now, because before I met her, I met him um, and he gave her to me. And now she's with him. And her worship is amazing. I, I, you know, you go to th see 3D movies, you know, um, she's seeing a trillion D right now, you know, <laughs> because it's right there live. You know, I've been in all through the scriptures, you know, what are they doing in heaven? Reading Revelation 4, Revelation 5, you know, Revelation 19, the, the, the worship that goes forth is overwhelming. They see, she sees it all now. And so God is like, stand on your feet and serve. It's time to go. It's time to go. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So for some of you, it may not look you may not understand it. You may think that maybe I'm supposed to be conducting myself a certain way and it doesn't look the way you think it's supposed to look and I don't really know what to say to you other than to um, just understand that I'm following the Lord. So I can't do what you think I'm supposed to do. I can't do that, you know. Um, it's just the way it is. So you got to let me follow him the way he's leading me, okay? All right. So... Um, that's where I'm at. I'm looking forward to seeing what he's going to do now. Um, in the scriptures, as we turn our heart to the word, this is the first day of the week, the week that the church gathers. Um, and there's so much more I could say to what I used to, what I just said, you know, uh, every Sunday when worship was over, Lisa would, you know, give me a kiss on the cheek. Some of y'all probably saw that every now and then. She would whisper, I'm praying for you. And she would go sit over there, even where Anthony's at or right up here. You know, um, we are more alive and aware of things when we're up there than we are down here. You know, so, so I haven't lost and cause we're grieving together. We haven't lost. She just got promoted. So she's there. We understand that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but we, we did this thing. This is what, I, it's time to, I gotta go. And so we think about the times we live in, all of the craziness of this world, all of the stuff that we hear. Um, one of the things Paul said to Titus, I don't want you to turn there, I'm just gonna read it really quick, was Paul was opening up his letter to Titus. He said, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, that's those of us who are born again, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords in godliness. I, I love that. The acknowledgement of the truth which accords in godliness. Um, there is a truth and it does accord in godliness. And I love that because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said this to them, and I, I'm going to get to Proverbs, but he says that the coming of the lawless one, that's the man of sin, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because, and this is what he says, they did not receive the love of the truth. I love that. The love of the truth that they may be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is a truth. 
and that truth we know is found in the word of God and that truth has told us the times that we would live in what they would look like and what is coming and so we need to abide in the love of the truth which accords in godliness as God is calling us to follow him to believe what he says to trust in everything that he says even if every man is a liar even if everything that we see is a lie uh, God is always true and so we need to be following him um, as we continue so Proverbs 18 is where we are and we're going to dive in. We made it down last week through verse 2 as we finish up chapter 17 and kind of eased in. We're going to pick it up in verse 3, but I'm going to read for context starting in verse 1. So if you're in Proverbs 18, 1, please say amen. amen. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. When the wicked comes contempt comes also and with dishonor comes reproach the words of a man's mouth are deep waters the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook it is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment a fool's lips enter into contention his mouth calls for blows a fool's mouth is a is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul the words of the talebearer are like tasty trifles and they go down into the inmost body he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe. A rich, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty and before honor is humility. And so, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the word that you've given to us, this text, Lord. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to it that we would, may hear what you would have to say that you would remove Lord from our hearts and minds the cares of this life the burdens of this world even the distractions from this room that you would push back the uh, influence of the enemy and that for this time Lord we would be perfectly safe and in your presence and that we may hear what you would say to us in Jesus name amen amen um, so as we dive in in verse 3 and a lot of these verses I'm going to cover maybe a few more verses today than I normally cover because some of these are kind of um, touching on things that we've already heard but remember the reason why things get repeated in, in this scripture is because we need to hear those things because we're thick headed we're slow spiritually sometimes and uh, we act like we forget or we didn't hear something and so the Lord knows that we're his children. He repeats the things that we need to hear. And some of these things are very simplistic, like verse three, um, when the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with this honor comes reproach. And contempt is something that springs from evil. Uh, it comes from, from judgment. It even says it springs, if you look up the, the definitions from prosperity, it, it hints towards a, uh, a prideful state of mind that the fool has. And this is why it comes on the tail end of verse one, where he says that um, the wicked are uh, in, in being led by their pride. They isolate themselves. We saw in verse one from those who may confront or challenge them. We discovered last week as we looked at verse one that um, those who isolate themselves uh, they uh, if you will pull away from the wisdom of the Lord they don't want to hear the wisdom of the Lord they don't want to be challenged by uh, the people of God they don't want to hear from the word of God they want to if you will live in their own uh, reality uh, and do their own thing and they miss out on the blessings of being when we talk about Christianity a part of the body of Christ how many of you were here last week and heard that where we we yeah we get ministered to by one another as we minister to one another and things things good things take place and so we see that but it's also why in verse 2 it says they have no delight in understanding but only in expressing his own heart speaking of the fool and the wicked one and so there's a there's a hint of pride that flows through all of this that uh, Solomon I believe is identifying and speaking to his children by uh, or with and so when the wicked comes contempt comes 
and with dishonor comes reproach or scorn. And so he's warning against these things that we shouldn't be isolated. Should, we should be open to listen and hear. We should be humble in ourselves that we may be led of the Lord and be able to be a part of the body of believers. And so these are things that we see consistently throughout. But as we go into verse four, this is a beautiful verse, which we'll pause for a moment. Notice it says in verse four, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom, notice, is a flowing brook. So there's an obvious contrast between the deep waters and the flowing brook. But the interesting thing, it says that the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. And I want you to understand that that's not implying that every time a person opens his or her mouth, deep things will come out. If you know people, you know that's not always the case. If you get out of your Christian bubble for a minute and do something like street ministry or something, you quickly find out that there's some crazy nuts out there who have nothing but a head of rocks, uh, rocks rattling around in it. You hear all kinds of stuff. But this does imply that a person's words, listen, come from the depth of his or her soul. Um, their words give you, listen, a window into their heart and into what's going on on the inside of them. We know this from scripture because Jesus says in Luke chapter six, verse 45, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks so our words flow from the depths of whatever has uh, been stored up in us, whatever we've been feasting upon, whatever we've been taking in, listening to, uh, watching, involving ourselves in, the people we spend our time with. Um, these things are uh, stored up in us and our words come from that place. It's very interesting. If you talk to someone long enough, the words, their words will indicate everything about them, their hopes, their dreams, their pain. Uh, their joy, their experiences. And sometimes they will even prophesy and don't even realize it because ultimately God is sovereign over, over everything, even sometimes the words that come out of our mouth. And what do I mean by that? Well, really quick, to take you on, a, on, on, on just a journey real quick. In John chapter 11, in John chapter 11, the high priest was speaking. Let me just read it. It says, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, he said to them, you know nothing at all. This is the priests and the Pharisees and all of them coming together. They wanted to kill and destroy Jesus. Y'all stay with me. So he says, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. The scripture tells us in verse 51, now this he said not, um, this he did not say on his own authority notice, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. I want you to catch the scene. They're having this meeting, plotting on how they're going to betray Jesus, capture Jesus and put him to death. Everybody understand that? They wanted Jesus out of the way. So in this argument, he makes this statement, not that the whole nation was in danger of perishing, but because he being high priest was moved upon by the Lord to make this statement literally prophesying on behalf of the nation that Jesus in fact would die but he would die to save the sins of the nations all who would come to him that whosoever would come would not perish but have everlasting life are y'all catching this he never intended to utter those words out of his mouth it's so interesting how things happen sometimes I remember standing in the lobby of the church and a man walked in who I actually knew because he served at another church so I was happy to see the guy. So, you know, I went to greet him and it came out of me so quick. I said to him, I said, hey, man, what you doing here? You hiding out? It just came out of my mouth. And indeed, I come to find out he was hiding out. He had gotten into some trouble over the other church and he was he was skipping out for a little bit. And then we ended up in my office talking and praying. <laughs> you know, I never meant to say that, but he's hiding out. and The Holy Spirit met him right where he was at and called him out. I'm like, I wasn't trying to prophesy. It's like, you can't even hide as a believer from the Lord, from his word and from the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Isn't that something? You gotta use a kid to say something to you. And so words have meaning. I've learned, listen, to pay attention to what people say. Often I can tell 
who they've been talking to because we influence one another and, and there are patterns to speech that, we, that I hear from time to time. You can tell what false doctrine a person has been entertaining and listening to by the things that come out of their mouth and how they begin to phrase things. And I've come to realize that, man, you know, um, these words mean something. They expose some things sometimes. That's why I, I want to be a little bit careful with what I say. Um, and I want to be very careful how I listen. Um, because God, he, he shows us things as we listen to people and as we, we spend time with these things. And so, and there's a difference too. Listen to me very carefully. There's a difference between those who belong to the Lord and those who don't. And, and what we are open to and how things happen, just like the Lord uh, moved upon Caiaphas, the high priest who was wicked, who wanted to destroy Jesus. And he ended up prophesying about the very good thing that Jesus was accomplishing in his ministry. And so this thing kind of happens. Um, and so listen, John chapter 13, verse two. These are scriptures we already know. Speaking of Judas, it says, and supper being ended, the last supper, the devil having notice already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to portray him. In other words, listen to me very carefully. Because Simon, I'm, I'm sorry, because Judas Iscariot had already rejected Jesus in his heart. I hope you're catching this. Therefore, because he had rejected the king of glory, his heart was open to the manipulation of Satan. Isn't that something? That's telling us something right there. In fact, Ephesians chapter two on the screen, verses one through three, this is good. It says, you know these verses, by the way, it says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Let's pause there for a moment. This is a biblical truth. I mean, everybody, I don't know all of you personally. Some of you are new. I gotta make this point very clear. He made us alive because we were previously dead. And what do I mean previously dead? Well, if you remember, God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely what? But how long did Adam live? Anybody know? Almost 900 years, right? Eight, 900, somewhere around there. I didn't bring the number. Yeah, he lived a long time after he even ate from the fruit. We don't know how long, but at least another 500 years after he ate of the fruit and fell. Isn't that something? So how then did he die well, he died spiritually, didn't he? Because he had rejected the living God and he lost some of the intimacy of the fellowship that he had previously had with God because to be alive, I can testify, is to know him intimately, to hear his voice, to hear him make impressions and movements in my heart that lead and guide me and comfort me. Like if you were born again, you know he's alive. You know, I might have to tell you anything, right? Amen? Amen. Okay, so he there was something lost there that Adam lost. Okay, and so this is what we understand. So you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Notice he says here, according to the course of this world, there's a, there's a pattern to this world system that we live in and that people are living by. According to the prince of the power, the air. And, and this, this pattern of the world, once you get saved, you kind of begin to recognize that you ain't a part of that anymore. You're going against the grain. Anybody understand what I'm saying? No? Okay, good. So he says then, you, you lived according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. We know that to be Satan, among whom we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as others. And so these verses are exposing that those who don't know God um, are being led by, manipulated by uh, the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. And it doesn't mean that just before you get saved that you walk around with a sinister grin and you wear black and all. It, it doesn't necessarily say that. It just means that you are open to the manipulation of the, not only the world system, but also the ruler of this world, Satan himself. And you really don't check out of that until you come to know the Lord. In contrast, once you become born again, once God has, 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 has poured his spirit into you, calling you his child, something different takes place. In fact, I'm going to go out of order back there, Jeff, but Galatians 4, 6 says, and because you are sons, which means and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your, into your hearts, crying what? Abba. Some languages are Baba, Father. Yeah, it means it's, it's basically a intimate form of saying daddy right or dad my children they don't even give me two syllables I'm just dad now 
because of the relationship. If my kids say father to me, I already know that they are trying to get something or ne <laughs> negotiate. Something's wrong if they call me father. So the spirit of Christ has gone into the hearts of those who believe by which we now have intimate relationship with him. And because we have intimate relationship with, with him, the spirit is crying, Abba. There's no formality there. We're now connected to the living God. We've checked out of the world system and now we're being led by him. Hebrews 10, 16 says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. In other words, now that we belong to him he's influencing us he's leading us he's pouring himself into us and so therefore we have this wonderful wonderful life that we live in the spirit and I shall say to you that if you're not experiencing that it's not anything to do with the Lord it's that you haven't taken advantage of the spiritual things that have already been given to us that have been won for us by Jesus Christ God is available to us and we need to just simply draw close to him but notice the contrast back over in, in uh, Proverbs 18, 4. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. Why? Because there's a depth to, to who we are in the sense of there's a whole lot of things inside of us, life experiences, things that we're, we're dealing with, the things that we've, we've been through in our lives. All of that stuff is in there. But the contrast is the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. It's an interesting contrast. On the surface, I wouldn't have paid much attention to it. The problem is I don't use the term brook in everyday conversation. Most of you don't either because I talk to you all the time. What in the world is a brook? How many of you know what a brook is? We think we do. That's a few of you would say I know what a brook is. Well, deep waters, obviously, is one thing, but a brook is totally different. A brook is even smaller than what we would consider to be a stream. A brook is a shallow, um, narrow, calm flowing body, a smaller than even a stream. If you look it up in the Hebrew, the first few places you see the word use, um, you see one, it's being used as of a, a wellspring itself, meaning the source of which living water springs up out of. I, uh, Isaac's servants dug a well, they hit a brook, a wellspring, a source of water, if you will. The other place speaks of a place where his servants were able to cross over because it's so shallow. And as I read that, you know what it made me think of? It made me think of Wednesday night when we look at the water that's coming from the right side of the temple in the kingdom that flows forth from Jesus himself and it goes out and heals the earth and provides food. How many of y'all remember that? Well, if you remember, it was like a flowing brook in that when it leaves the temple, it's very shallow, almost to, I think a mile and a half out, it's very shallow. And then it turns into a raging river further out. Y'all remember that? And it speaks of the fact that close to the source, which is Jesus, it's shallow water like a brook, meaning a child can actually play in it. It's not dangerous at all. It's just nourishing and healing and supplying that which is needful for everyone throughout the kingdom age. Likewise, in the New Jerusalem, Revelation 21 and 22, we see that that also has this river, if this water, this calm water. And I look at this verse, the difference is a man's, uh, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters, but here's the thing, wisdom. We're talking about the book of Proverbs. It's speaking of the wisdom of God. Check it out. The wisdom of God is it's the wellspring of wisdom, I should say, but it's the wisdom of God is a flowing brook. In other words, it's the shallow, calm water that comes directly from the source and it's calm near the place where it originates, which is very, very from the very place of God himself. And it speaks to the fact that when you draw close to him, the wisdom, the knowledge, the things that you need for this life flow like a calm brook. They come out so easy and so nice and it refreshes you and, and you receive from him that which you need if you draw close to him. I was telling the first service, the town that my mother's from um, in Duplin County, Kenansville, um, and I couldn't remember the name. My cousin's here now, so she might know the name of what they call it, but there's a spring downtown Kenansville, and they bricked it up where you could actually go down there and, and get water from a, a real spring. I don't know if it's still there, if it still runs. No, it stopped up finally, but when we were kids, you could go. My grandfather used to go down there and fill up his jugs because he liked the water. It had a sweetness to it, and it was always cold, and it ran 24-7 all year round, you know, and 
And this is being described this way. The wisdom that comes forth from the Lord is that way. It comes out calm, it's sweet, and it refreshes. The question is, are you receiving that on a daily basis? I have to tell you right now that it, God is always available. He's always pouring into us. We just have to take advantage to spend time with him. You are as close to him as you want to be. And if you're not receiving what you need from the Lord, there's something in the way in your life. And maybe you need to pray and say, Lord, what is it? What's hindering me from being able to draw from you the, the sweetness of this word, the shallowness that even a child can draw near? What's in your way? Is it a sin? Is it a person? Is it something that you, uh, an idol, something that is more important to you than him? Because there are a lot of idols probably in the hearts and minds in this room, whether it's work or play, whether it's a relationship or whatever the case may be. What's causing you to be dry and not nourished by the very living waters that come forth from the Lord? The Lord said to the woman at the well, he says, yeah, you, if you drink of this water, you will thirst again. But if you knew who, who it was that you're talking to and, and who he is, if you asked him, he would give you living water that you would never thirst again. Jesus says, all you who, who are thirsty, come unto me. You remember that? And so Jesus is, is saying that I want to provide for you daily spiritual nourishment that you would not thirst but that you will be well nourished. And so if that's available, y'all know me. If the Bible says that I can be refreshed anytime I want from the Lord himself, that his wisdom is always available for me, that in his presence um, is, is, uh, I can find this, uh, this joy everlasting, this, this fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures evermore. If those things are true, then I gotta have that. And I'm telling you, I've been testing him it's available in, in, in ways that would, would just constantly blow your mind and nourish you. The Lord wants you to spend time with him that he can nourish you in this way. And the other side of this too is, is that it's, it's a flowing brook. It's, 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 it's calm. And I think even this wisdom that comes forth from a person, when you go to God's people and you sit and you talk to them, they can just simply pour out this calm wisdom that comes from the Lord that's so simplistic it's so good and it's, it's, they're getting it every day. It's not the depths, you know, it's not all the stuff that's in the deep. No, this is living, it's running. You have a conversation with a person that's spending time with the Lord every day, they always got something new to tell you. But you can get that yourself. And so I wanna encourage you before I move on because some of you, you're looking at me like, you know, I, I don't quite get it. That's the looks I'm getting from some places in the room. I don't quite understand what you're saying. That's a problem for me as your pastor. Because I ain't here to entertain you. I ain't even all that eloquent. I just want you to get what he's got for you. And so if you running around searching for everything else, I'm trying to tell you, you need to turn back to him. You don't need, it's not a place. It's not a church. Some of us are stuck in tradition. You know, we know that. We, 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 we can go back to the churches we grew up in with all of this stuff, you know, the organ and the way they do things. And it makes us feel comfortable. It's an emotional experience that we might have. Yeah, we, all of that stuff is there. You know, and we think, we, in our carnality, we think that way. We think that spirituality is about things and stuff and where you go. But Jesus says, I'm just looking for those who will worship me in spirit, spirit and in truth. You can find him anywhere you are because he's the, he's the living God. There's nothing that can hinder you and him getting close together. So this is what I need you to understand. If you draw close to him, scripture says, he will draw close to you. And there's nothing that can hinder that. Nothing at all that can hinder that. I know I need to, I need to move on. So verse five, I'll come back to that thought. Some of these verses are very simple again, and I'm gonna move swiftly. Notice it says it is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. The interesting thing about this verse is it speaks of both our carnality as well as demonic influence. What do I mean? Well, the carnal part of it, to show partiality to the wicked. Well, who would show partiality with? Who would favor the wicked? Well, in our carnality, we do. Um, and man does, doesn't he? Man can put somebody up because of their estimation of who he is. Even God said this to, to Samuel when he went to anoint the next, the second king of Israel, y'all remember? And in his carnality, the way men think, he saw some dudes that looked like they should be captains in the army, they should be king. Oh man, this dude's tall. I mean, look at his biceps. He's athletic, he's outspoken, he should be king. And God says, no, 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 I refused him. 
don't look like at, at it the way man looks but 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 the way God would look and so it was the runt who was out there with the sheep who God was calling to be king because we our estimation is always wrong it, unless we are being led by the spirit of God we show partiality because of our carnality if a person has wealth if a person has eloquence if a person's handsome or if she's pretty these are the ones that we would show partiality to these are the ones that should be out front these are the ones that we but you know God is always doing things differently than the way we are so it exposes the carnal nature of man which simply speaks to well those of us in the room when making judgment on anything the body of Christ we need to be led to the spirit of God because I don't know and in my own estimations I'm gonna pick wrong every time however there's ways that we can allow the, the, ourselves to be led of the Lord with the counsel of wisdom that comes forth from the people of God or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. That speaks of demonic influence. Well, what do I mean? Well, it's Satan who hates the righteous. He hated Christ and therefore he hates us. The Bible says that he comes to do nothing but still kill and destroy. And so therefore, anytime that we are overthrowing the righteous in any way in this world, it hints of demonic influence. I want to move on. Uh, verse 6. Uh, notice it says a fool's lips enter into contention we've seen this before um, and his mouth calls for blows a fool's mouth is his destruction all of these are speaking of the same thing his lips are the snare of his soul um, the words of a talebearer. Uh, uh, let me pause for a moment so all of these are speaking of the fact that the fool is going to get in trouble with his mouth every time because he's not yielded to the spirit of God again not only do we need to listen and pay attention but we need to be careful with how we use our words. We understand that the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles um, and they go down into the inmost parts. Now, you know, scholars are divided over what this means and how it's, uh, how it's translated. The King James says that the words of a talebearer are wounds. They go to the inward part, you know, um, and so here it's different. And so it hints either to the fact that the words of a talebearer are satisfying or, or we're, we're excited to hear them because a lot of us like gossip or they're so impactful that they deliver wounds and they in, impact our inward part. Both are fine because we know that the words of a talebearer are destructive. That's the bottom line. When the talebearer shows up, we have to say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want it going into me. I don't want it corrupting me. I don't want to know about it. Remember, we talked about that before. All right, verse nine. Look, he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Who is the destroyer? Yeah. So that means that the slothful person is acting like Satan in a sense. Hmm. Well, what does slothful mean? It means to be lazy. So we've seen this. Now, you know, why is Solomon always on this thing? He doesn't like the fool. He doesn't like the, the, the tail barrel. He doesn't like lazy people. Solomon is constantly talking about lazy people. Have y'all caught that yet? Yeah, he says, look, I don't want you, don't get in debt, don't be lazy, but be diligent, work. Well, why is all of this? Well, because listen, to be lazy is very much opposite of God. And the spirit of God would, cre would create diligence within us. And we've talked about this before. It doesn't mean you need to be working to the point that you're sweating every day. No, some of you have desk jobs. But it speaks of as believers, we're diligent. We're accomplishing the things of God. We're making an impact and a difference in this world that we live in. A lot of times what we fail to do is study church history. Um, and I mean the real church history. I'm not talking about the dark ages that's influenced by false doctrine that, you know. But I'm saying if you really go back into church history, what you find is that the church herself outperforms governments. It's the church that starts orphanages and schools and colleges and institutions and um, hospitals and, and places for people who are mentally disturbed to be able to be ministered to. It's throughout the ages, the last 2000 years, these are the things that the church has been doing. The church digs wells. The church builds homes for homeless. The church has always done these things in a very healthy way when the church is allowed to do it as she is led by the spirit okay when the government gets involved it always goes downward because the government is corrupt and it refuses to yield to the spirit of God and that's the truth I don't care I ain't trying to offend anybody I don't get into the politics because sometimes y'all get upset with me but but governments are wicked why because they're led by men simple as that but the church is diligent not perfect but diligent hard-working loving people 
And so this is our heritage. So if you struggle with slothfulness, if you're lazy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just encourage you today to begin to call on the Lord to get that out of you, to lead you away from that. It is a hard thing. We live in a new environment. Um, we live in a new environment. I got to be careful because I'm on live stream too. But, you know, Christian men, we ain't called to be sitting home gaming. I got to really be careful now. All right. Um. There, but I'm, I don't, I'm, no, I'm not going to let y'all egg me on because I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but we're called to work hard to represent um, our father and how he's created us. The, the Bible says that the Lord labored six days and on the seventh he rested. There's a pattern there. We're called to have a Sabbath in our life, a time where we rest and, and, uh, and, and get close to the Lord. But um, generally speaking, we're accomplishing things. We're the people of God. We, we represent him. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We don't have time for slothfulness. It's, uh, it's abnormal to who we are as we've been called by the Spirit. Anyway, verse 10, this is where we'll, we'll begin to wrap up for today. Verse 10, check this out. The name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe. Now, this is a very interesting verse. Now, strong tower is a mighty elevated fortress. Okay, so it speaks of in times of war, if a city had an elevation to it and wall around it, it was a fortress that was almost impenetrable. It would be very difficult for any army to penetrate a city that was elevated with a wall. And that's the picture, okay? So that's what we, we see here. And so it says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, but I hope you caught what it said because sometimes we read too fast and we miss things. It did not say the Lord himself is a strong tower. Obviously he is, he's God. It actually said the name of the Lord is a strong tower that's different now I got to figure out what this verse is talking about because there's an implication here to me as a believer that I can't I can't move on without meditating on Philippians chapter 2 says it this way therefore God also highly exalted him Jesus and uh, and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow um, of those in heaven Check it out. In heaven, those on earth, those who are under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we're talking about the name of the Lord, we are also talking about the name of Jesus. And there's power. There, there's so much power in the name of Jesus that just at his name, his name alone invokes terror in our enemy. But what causes the name to become so powerful for us? Well, it's the fact that he is truly our Lord in whom we trust. It speaks of a relationship that has taken place. And what do I mean by that? Well, so for years, I've heard people with a similar story. In fact, I went through this back at one point in my life, my, my wife did, and I talked to people here who've been through this same thing that in the middle of the night, there's like this uh, paralyzing presence that can come that would prevent you from being able to, to move. Anybody ever been through that? You know, yeah, there's a, there's a man, what, which is in first service where I know very well, who used to be involved in witchcraft, and when he got saved and got out, even then, this thing would come. And... I remember it uh, coming to me and attacking me when I was uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. It was right around 97. That's how far back, 97. And I remember the one thing that I knew from my time in church was when that takes place, you call upon the name of Jesus. And so I called upon the name of Jesus. But check it out. I couldn't speak it, but I just thought it. And it would break. Now, how is just me thinking the name of Jesus that powerful? In my mind, I couldn't even utter it with my, it's just the name of Jesus is a powerful thing. But it's powerful, understand what I'm saying? Because of relationship. Now, here's what I mean. How many of you are from the 80s? Raise your hand. Don't, don't, okay, good. So those of us who came out of the 80s, we remember this movie uh, came out in 82, I think, 85. 
and the movie was named Fright Night. Anybody y'all remember Fright Night? Oh my lord. From the 80s. Yeah, in Fright Night, the crazy thing about the movie was um in you know in the 80s there was a lot of catholic influence in the movie still is. And so there was always this thing where, you know, when the vampire come at you, you grab the cross. Y'all remember that? But the vampire would laugh at the person if they didn't actually have faith. You don't have any faith, so that doesn't work for you. Y'all remember that? But there's a little truth to it. It was funny because Satan likes to throw little things in his stuff and pick fun at us. But the reality is there's truth to it. What do you mean, Pastor Kevin? Well, in Acts chapter 19, there's a story given to us of something similar. And this is where I want to challenge you all on because we're not religious. We have a relationship with Christ. Amen. So really quick, look in uh, Acts chapter 19. Y'all doing all right? I still got a few minutes. Y'all looking at me like I'm going too long. In 19, so in Acts chapter 19, there was um, Paul's in Ephesus. Some great, a lot of unusual things are taking place. I'm gonna start reading. You can get there when you get there. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 says, "Now God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick." and the disease left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the inherent Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, check this out, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. In other words, <laughs> So you already know they got problems. They, they don't even know who this Jesus is. But they, were, they would perform exorcists. People would take their love, their people were possessed. They would take them to these exorcists and pay them money and all this kind of stuff. It was a racket, basically. Okay. Um, so notice verse 14. Also, there were, so, there were sons, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So this chief priest had seven sons and they practiced exorcists for money. Verse 15. And the evil spirit uh, answered and said to them, so they're trying to exercise a spirit out of somebody in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached. So the evil spirit said to them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? <laughs> now, if you're trying to exercise a demon and he says that, you're in trouble. Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and, and wounded. In other words, they got beat up by the demon. Why did they get beat up by the demon? Because they tried to kick him out in the name of Jesus who somebody else preached. There's no relationship. They, they didn't know him intimately. But even when a child knows Jesus personally, because all you need is the faith of a, of a child to come to him then there's power in it and it causes the enemy to tremble this is amazing is this the name of Jesus do you know Jesus personally because if you know Jesus personally when you call upon his name stuff happens Psalm 91 says and he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty I will say of the Lord he is my refuge and my fortress my God and him I will trust Psalm 18 says I will I, I will love you O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Oh my goodness, this is wonderful language. He says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The psalmist understood something because God was his and he knew him and he was his strong tower. He called upon his name often. Psalm 105 verse one says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Uh, 116 4 says I, then I called upon the name of the Lord O Lord I implore you deliver my soul 116 13 says I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord 116 17 says I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord over and over and over the psalmist knew uh, as he was being uh, chased and persecuted and everything going on in his life he knew that I will call upon the name of the Lord and I, you teach your children this this is what gets them you teach them when they're four and five and three and two even if they can comprehend it that when you are scared call upon the name 
of Jesus. He is the only one who's always there and will never fail you. You pour that into a child, that's how you make a mighty Christian. You pour it into the child when they're young. Call upon the name of the Lord. So when I look at verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Yes, to the one who believes, there's power there. The name of the Lord. And with the spirit of God is in you crying Abba Father that's why sometimes you just want to call his name you may not have a song you may not have words of a prayer you may not remember scripture but sometimes the spirit just moves on you to call upon his name anybody other than me understand what I'm saying and just call upon him and something happens he's there he's a very present help in time of need the righteous it says in this verse run to it and are safe speaking of the name of the Lord like he haven't he hasn't necessarily given us a physical place of refuge on the earth maybe I mean yes we come into the camp of the saints we come to church there's safety here in the, in the midst of the numbers the assembly is something that we have praise God for it amen but even when you can't do that on Tuesday night when church ain't open for instance that's why this can't be religion if you want to practice religion there are places where you can do that but we're saying you need to know him personally you need to call upon him and that's what I keep challenging you to do. I'm trying to be as open with you as possible with the things I've been through in the last 30 days. It's just, that's what it's been. Jesus, his name has been a way for me to escape. Calling upon him, looking to him, going into his word, spending time with him in prayer all the time. And even back when I used to work outside the church, I always told you all this. I did it all day long at work. How many of you are going to work tomorrow? It always amazes me that everybody don't raise their hand. <laughs> How many of you are going to work this week? Okay. How many of you are retired? Okay, that's why I'm getting those hands. All right. Um, why would you go into the world to work and not call upon the name of Jesus? I'm trying to get you to understand this. You're going into the enemy's area. Is everybody you work with saved? And why would you go in that place without calling upon the name of the Lord? Is your boss saved? Some of you maybe, some of you maybe not. Why would you go work for them without calling upon the name of the Lord? All day long, as often as he comes across your mind, in the difficulties, in the meetings, um, in the things, all the stuff, man. Jesus wants to be there with you all this week, y'all. I hope you understand what I'm saying. He is very, very real, and he is your strength. Without him, you have no strength. So let's pray. Father, thank you today for allowing us once again to come into this place to worship you, to praise your name. Lord, I pray that you've moved mightily by your word in our hearts and in our minds to, Lord, bring about change in how we conduct ourselves and, and how we operate in the midst of the week that's ahead of us, Lord God. I pray that you would go before us, that you would clear a path, that you would guard our rear, that you would give us the sermon, that you would lead and guide us. But Lord, most of all, I pray that we would remember to call upon you in every moment, whether it's, a, it's a, 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 a wonderful experience or a difficult one. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.